verses 12 to 20. That is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. That's found in your few Bibles on page 1702. That's page 1702 of your few Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will uh, raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do, do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins people commit are outside their body. But those who sin sexually sin against their own bodies. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Amen. Amen. With, uh, with so very few people here in the sanctuary. Randy, you trying to throw me off? Yeah. Really? You didn't want to fall for it? Yeah. I mean, if it was like 100 people here, maybe it would fool me. You yeah. sat in a different chair. <laughs> yeah? I looked out and said, oh, Randy's not here today. What's wrong? You know? He I moved over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, now that you're here, I also want to thank Randy for the work that he's been doing uh, uh, along with Angie, helping out Angie, but also yesterday we had a, a backup. Uh, it flooded here in the, in, the, in the church, and unholy things came back up, and uh, Randy was here to make sure to when the plumber finished doing all the work that Randy stayed and cleaned everything. So thank you, Randy, for, for again for your hard work. I read a story about a man who had a friend who had moved from, uh, from New York to Texas, to West Texas, and he had gotten a ranch, so he went out to see his friend, and he says, uh, you know, what, what, nice ranch, what name did you give it? He said, well, I wanted to call it the Bar J Ranch. I thought that was a good name, but my wife, she wanted to call it the Susie Q Ranch. And then my son, he had a name. He wanted to call it the Flying W Ranch. Then my daughter wanted to call it the Lazy Y Ranch. They said, well, what, what did you do? Well, we called it the Bar J, Susie Q, Flying W, Lazy J, J Y uh, Ranch. So, said, whoa, that's a large name. I, I, thought, I thought this was cattle ranch. Where are the cattle? Yeah, they didn't survive the branding. Uh, what happens when we compromise and try to compromise and compromise and compromise? Only disaster happens. Only things go bad. And unfortunately, you know, sometimes Christians do end up compromising too much. Uh, we live in a society where Christians are constantly compromising and constantly going the way of the world rather than the way of Christ. And certainly when it comes to sexual, sexual ethics, that happens all too often. And Christians are, are, are doing things they shouldn't be doing, and they're justifying it in one way or another, or rationalizing or whatever. And it's not a new thing. It's been happening for a long time. I mean, I don't get to hear as many confessions as I did when I was a kid. I, ironically, when I was a young Christian, I worked so hard to keep myself pure. I kept my way, I kept away from the things of the world. But for some reason, I became the confessor. And people would come to me, young people coming to me, telling me the things that they were doing. I'm like, you know, really, I don't need to hear this. <laughs> Seriously, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm under control. I don't need to be out of control. And I don't need to justify saying, well, Lord, look, everybody else is doing it. But I would hear some of the craziest things of trying to rationalize immorality. You know, one of the wackiest was, I remember this young man who was a Christian, he started dating this girl who was a younger Christian, and I knew her, and I had been discipling her. 
And one day she comes to me and tells me, oh, no, no children here. Oh, praise God. Good. Uh, I, I was going to give an X-rated warning before I started this message. I forgot about it. Yeah, but there's no kids here, so that's good. So she, you know, she comes and tells me that they're, they're having oral sex. And I'm like, what? And she says, oh, yeah, yeah. And she tells me a young man and it goes, to, it goes to a Christian college, Christian university. I will not name it. And um, says the, the, the professor there says that it's okay, that it's not a sin. And I said, really? <laughs> that's interesting. So I said to her, tell me something, is lusting a sin? And she said, oh yeah, the Bible says lusting is a sin. So you're telling me that you and your boyfriend get naked and he doesn't lust after you? She broke it off. <laughs> it's like simple logic, people. You don't have to get to the oral part to know that you're already lusting for each other. But this is the way that he used to find a loophole, to find some sort of rationalization so he could justify his sin and bring this young girl, who's a young Christian, thank God her faith was not damaged, into this sin. Uh, and this is exactly what's happening in the Corinthian church. People are justifying, rationalizing what they're doing. Uh, and they're going to the uh, oldest trade, you know, to prostitution. Now, the word pornea originally meant going to prostitutes. That's exactly what it means here. They were going to prostitutes. And they were justifying that it's okay. And they had their own rationale for it. And... They didn't want anybody confronting them. They wanted to, they were self-righteous. They were justified just like today. And in case you want to be harsh on the Corinthians, just think about the story I told you. And I could tell you so many more. And I'm sure you can tell me others as well. People just doing things that are just out of control. And yet not wanting to live the way the Lord wants them to live. And so Paul in this passage when he deals with them, he confronts their ideology, their philosophy. And he corrects it, but then he takes it further. And I want us to meditate on it and see not only about sexual immorality being wrong, but the principles that we should have as Christians in the way that we behave and how we look at ourselves and our bodies and who we think we belong to. Uh, because that's something that's still going on today in today's society, and we're going to get into that. Uh, first of all, he deals in verse 12 and 13 by dealing with their philosophy. And you see that the NIV puts the certain words in quotes because this, these are probably words that come from the Corinthians. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. You know, the Corinthians had their slogan, and one of them was, I have the right to do anything. Man, doesn't sound like the American playbook right there. I was like, are you sure these are Corinthians? Are you sure these words weren't changed to make it sound like American? Americans just, I have a right. It's my body, my choice. I can do whatever I please. I am free. And these are not non believers. These are Christians saying it. And they're saying to Paul, Paul, didn't you say that we're free? If the Son has set you free, you are free indeed. And Paul must have been reading this like, really? Seriously? Are you, God has set us free from sin, and now you feel free to sin. No, you're going back to the very slavery that you're taken out of. But Paul doesn't go there yet. He begins by tackling the very thing that they're saying. And he says, oh yes, you argue that I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. So yes, you are free in Christ. But it doesn't mean that just because you're free, everything that you can do, you should do. Or everything you can do will be good for you. Certainly going to a prostitute won't be good for you, at least not in the long run. I mean, Paul's not a prude, and he's certainly not a, a, an idiot. He realizes, yeah, sexually you might have fun, but for the moment, the pleasure is for the season. But what benefit would that do to you in the future? What benefit would that bring to your spouse if you're married? What benefit would it bring to your children? What benefit would it bring to the church? None. And then he takes them one step further and says, yes, you can do whatever you please, but I will not be mastered by anything. Uh, one person renders it, all things are in my power, but I shall not be overpowered by anything. If you're really free, then nothing should control you. So many people say that I'm free and they're addicts to drugs or sex or whatever. They're not free. It may have started out with freedom. It may have started because they felt they could do whatever they please and they thought, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. It's not, it's one time won't bother me, twice won't bother me. And now they have to do it. Now they're addicted. So the very thing that they should have mastered has now mastered them. And control them. And so Paul attacks them on that. Then they, he goes to the second slogan. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both of them. In other words, look. When my stomach is hungry, I eat. When my sexual parts are hungry, I feed them. 
That's their logic. Almost sounds a little bit Aristotelian, but in a perverse way. Yeah. And Paul's like, really? First of all, just because you're hungry, you shouldn't be eating all the time. That's called gluttony. You know, I, I, I never preach a sermon on gluttony, so it's, I get to every now and then put it in there. Gluttony is a sin. <laughs> you know, you're overdoing it. And sexually, yes, sex is good within the boundaries that God has created. Because God says, your body is not your body, it's God's body. So yeah, they're partially right and partially wrong. So he doesn't completely condemn them. He just says, here, you're right, but here are some things that are restrictions to what you're saying. Sex is certainly good. Paul is not one to say, no, sex is wrong. You shouldn't have sex. We should all stay away from sex. Uh, sex is only for procreation. No, on the contrary, when you read uh, 1 Corinthians 7, you'll see he says, this is good for each other. You're supposed to have sexual relationship with your husband, with your wife. You're supposed to be together. And when you separate, it's only for a season and because of agreement that you're going to do it for prayer or fasting, whatever. For some reason, you're separate, but then you agree to come back together because it is wholesome. It is healthy. Uh, this is part of God's plan. And he doesn't say anywhere in 1 Corinthians 7, hey, you, need, you need to do this because you need to have babies. No, never. So it shows that God created the sexual act for pleasure. You know, the enemy is the one that perverts all the good things that God has done. You know, the enemy doesn't create anything good. You know, one thing I love about the screw tape letters when you read C.S. Lewis is that the enemy says, you know, the, the demon says, you know, we, we, we haven't been able to come up with our own pleasures. We've only been able to pervert the pleasures that God has created. That's what they do. They take sex, which God created, and they pervert it. They find ways to do it in ways that God says, no, don't do it this way. You know, eating is wonderful. It's, it's, who's, who says eating is not good? Eating is great. Having a great meal, yes. But then when it becomes just obesity and eating and eating and not really being careful, uh, alcohol is good. Yes, it's good to have wine. You know, it's good to have a beer. It's good to eat a drink. It's not good to get drunk. And if you can't control yourself, then you shouldn't have the first one. You know, if the first one leads to the 10th one, then you shouldn't have the first one. If you can't control yourself, you have to master yourself and say, well, I'm sorry, this is something that I cannot control in my life, and therefore, I will have none of it. You know, I actually gave up drinking for other reasons. I gave up drinking because ever since I had my problem with my neck and my back, and I had dizzy problems, I said, well, I never want to feel dizzy again. <laughs> I had vertical, no thank you. Everywhere I go now, I say, you know, someone's offering me a drink, I'm like, no, no thank you. And they're probably thinking, oh, he's Baptist. No, man, I had vertical. I never, I don't want to, I'm not even playing around, though, I want to feel dizzy, you know? Not, if I have a dream that I'm dizzy, I wake up, I wake up angry. You know, I'd hate it. So, but it's nothing wrong with having a drink. It's nothing wrong with wine. Actually, in the ancient world, wine was more common because, of course, who would drink the water? <laughs> you know, the natural water. <laughs> it's like, here, you know, it's like, uh, was it Back to the Future 2 or 3? Where they give, they give him uh, water. Oh, here's the purest water. You see, it's like all muddy and disgusting. Yeah, so wine was more convenient, but it could also lead to problems. Uh, so again, we, we are free to do these things. These are gifts from God, but we're not to be mastered by them. We're to control them. But then Paul takes it further. and brings it into the Christian philosophy of how we should live. He says, it is actually, uh, you know, he says to them that we should live the way that is holy. You know, and holy does not mean be the opposite of the world. Sometimes people think, well, to be a Christian, you must be the opposite of the world. No. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 5? A man sleeping with his stepmother. And the world had it right, but the church had it wrong. Not everything the church, the world does is wrong. You know? So we can't say, oh, well, the world is doing this. Let me do the opposite. No. We are not anti-world. We are pro-Christ. Always keep that in your mind. Make your philosophy to imitate Jesus, to imitate the principles of the Bible, not to say I'm going to be against whatever so-and-so does or whatever that church does or whatever that place does. No, it has to be what does the word of God say of how I should be? And that's the way we are to live. And then he goes on in verse 13 to 20 to talk to them about the importance of the body and how sexual sins, anything against the body is a sin against God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he makes it very clear, the body belongs to the Lord. It's ironic that the whole feminist movement was, my body, my choice. I can do whatever I please, it's my body. Ironically, now you hear people on the right saying the same thing, my body, my choice. And you're like, really? Really? And I'm like, 
You're either listening to CNN or, or Fox News, you know, the one conservative liberal, but you're not listening to Jesus. Christians, here's your slogan. Here's the slogan you should have. God's body, God's choice. God's body, God's choice. I don't belong to me. I don't belong to you. I belong to God. And I have to go according to what God says that I should do. And so he judges them and says, you've been grafted into Christ. You are one with Christ. You need to behave that way. Don't go to a prostitute. When you go to a prostitute, you're uniting the things of Christ with things of this world. And that is not good. Uh, and he says, when you do unite with them, you become one with them. Think about it. Wherever you go, you take Christ with you. And if you unite yourself with things that aren't holy, you're uniting the things of Christ with things that aren't holy. And now somebody said, well, you know, I'm not like that pastor. I mean, I, I mean, I understand that the guys were going to prostitutes, but I have my girlfriend and we love each other. Again, I always ask them a question when they tell me that they love each other. I said, how many people have you loved? Yeah, because it seems like I'm in love today with this person and next week I'm in love with that person and they're able to justify their sinfulness. The Bible is very clear. Your body belongs to the Lord. You belong to Christ. You don't get to decide. The Bible says that any sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman is sin. Period. It's that simple. And it's that difficult. And when we take our bodies, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we take it somewhere and unite it to a prostitute, we are uniting Christ to the prostitute. It's almost, again, the language that is used is the language of marriage, bonded together, one flesh, you know? And of course, the prostitute is not simply the prostitute. The prostitute stands for the world, for the things of the world. So it's not simply, oh, oh, well, okay, I'll never go to a prostitute. No, but when you connect yourself to the things of the world, to the filth of the world, to the things of this life, and you say, well, I'll make the world part of me, now you've contaminated Christ. Now you've united Christ to the things that are anti-Christ. So it can't, it's just not, the, not just the, the prostitute, although that Paul sees the severity of that because that's a sin committed in the flesh. But other sins do have a sense of bringing you into the world in a way that you're not supposed to be. So what's the solution? Control yourself. Control yourself. Pray to the Holy Spirit. You know, I've seen people that, you know, they have problems because they have cable TV and they don't like what they see on table and they've had to cancel their cable. I knew a man who actually cam canceled his computer. He had no computer. And when asked, he said it was because he had a pornographic problem. And I thought, wow, that is courageous. He realized this is so bad for me that even though it's a great technology and I can use it for so many things, I can't use it because it's leading me away from Christ and that's the most important thing for me. So we can do that. Certainly we can be accountable to others. You know, if we're struggling with sin and we're having a problem, if we're being tempted. Oh my goodness, if you're being tempted to cheat on your spouse, if you're being tempted to, to sleep around, go talk to a believer who's grounded in the Lord, who's mature. Tell them, look, I'm struggling. What can I do? You know, let's pray. Help me. You know, there are so many things that really can be done. Uh, what you have to realize is that you belong to the Lord. You know, if you, if you think about your, uh, about your body, it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a place that we sanctify for Christ and we use it for his glory. But you are his house. You are his P.O. box. If God was to give his address, he'd give your body and say, I live here. I live here. He lives inside of you. Now that makes it much, that'll make you radically different in the way that you live if you realize who lives inside of you and therefore how you should live, how you should do things. And you realize, I have been bought, like Peter says, you were bought not with something that ruins like gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, who was who was who like a pure and perfect lamb died for us. You know, this is the price paid. I was bought. I don't belong to me. I was a slave to sin. I was in bondage to sin. Christ bought me out of that slavery, and now He's my master. God's body, God's choice. But sin is so rampant within our society. Uh, so rampant that you always think, oh, young people, young people. No, it's not only young people. It's older people, too. So many people falling into sin. Uh, recently, there's been a, a great debate in the theological world over Karl Barth. I don't know if any of you know Karl Barth. But he's been known as, he's called the greatest theologian in the, from the first half of the 20th century. And people love him. They love his writing. He's so deep. He's so Christ-centered. 
Well, recently it was found out, and finally the book came out and scandals there, that this whole time that he's doing all this, he's having an affair with his secretary. His wife knows about it and disapproves of it. And what does he say to her, basically? I need this. Really? Now, this is what I want you to put your mind through the way I put my mind through. Here's a man who is centered on Christ. Everything is Christ for him. So much so that he wouldn't even listen to reason or anything else. Everything is Christ. Christ, Christ, Christ. And he's writing books about Christ, Christ, Christ. And yet he needs sin as he's writing books about the holiest being that ever existed, ever will exist. That's irrational. Maybe he needed reason too. Maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons I don't read him much because he, he's anti-reason. And reason is like common sense. How can I be talking about the glorious things of Christ, be saying that I'm, this is my center of my universe, and yet I need a woman to commit adultery against my wife so I can be satisfied? That is irrational. See, so it's not kids. One of the major theologians of our times is doing this. And people find ways to rationalize. I'm sure he, ra I mean, obviously he found a way to justify rational. He didn't go around saying, oh, I'm sinning. You know, because some people, you know, if you mess up, you go, I sinned. You know, I fell into sin. I, I, I had an affair. This is wrong. I have to give this up. Lord Jesus, help me. You know, when I sin, I repent. You know, this guy wasn't repenting. This guy was living this life. And I feel, I, I feel even worse for his wife. You know, having to live in silence. In silence, because she never exposed him. It came out because of him and the things that he, the communication that he had with this other lady who was his secretary. And then the innuendos came out and they realized there it is. But it wasn't her. But all the torture she went to being faithful to him, and yet he was not faithful to her. You know, and yet he's writing about Christ. You know, sin is rampant within our society. We have to be so vigilant. As Christians, you know, um, you know I had a quote here. I didn't, I didn't quote it. It says, um, I, I know I skipped the quote. I realized that I skipped it now because it was from Ernest uh, Caseman where he says, um, all of life, everything in life is war. There is no neutral ground. And as Christians, we have to live that way. There is no neutral ground. We have to be careful all the time. And it's really, it might be some, it is difficult to live that way, but you have to live that way. We have to be vigilant because we know that 24-7, the enemy is going to be working to see how he can knock you down. What do I need to do to stop this person from being holy? What will it take? Will it be money, success, sex, just cable TV? What, what? He'll do whatever he needs to do. But you have to be vigilant that he's coming after you. And you have to resolve in your mind, in your heart, I will be holy. And of course, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because you cannot do it by yourself. You know, pray to the Lord. Lord, help me to be holy. <clears throat> and when you find yourself in a situation that is tempting, flee. Leave. Don't think. Don't rationalize. Don't justify. Get out of that situation. Don't get into those situations. You know, like the joke that was posted. You know, a man goes to the doctor and says, Doctor, I broke my arm in three places. And the doctor says, Well, stay out of those places. Yeah, If you have places that are tempting you, why are you going there? Stay away from them because they're going to keep tempting you. Again, these are the important things. Remove any obstacles in your life that are going to make you sin against the Lord. And above all, above all, in a real true sense, because I don't believe Carl Barr was doing it in a true sense, stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. You know, other sheep are wandering around the gate. No, I'm at the feet of the Lord. I'm meditating on his word. I'm talking to him. From the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, I am talking to my Lord. I am near him. And if I feel or see anything that wants to take me away from my Lord, I take that away from me. And I stay away from it. You know, again, we live in a world that is rampant with sin. Uh, and it's not easy to live the Christian life. But it is beneficial. It is fruitful. It is a blessing. In the end, we're the ones who end up being blessed because of how we have served the Lord and been faithful to him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who guides us. We ask, Lord, that you help us, Father, in things that we're going through in this world, dear Lord, to keep our minds on you and to keep our hearts on you. 
Father, not to have the slogans of the world or the slogans of the Corinthians. You know, I am free, it's my body, it's this, it's that. We need to have your slogans that remind us that we are yours, that I am a slave and you are my master. This is your body. This is your temple. You live inside of me. I belong to you. You have given your blood to buy me. Father, help us to be reminded of this in everything that we think, everything that we feel, everything that we do, uh, to live in the manner that reflects your glory. We thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the peace and fellowship of his Holy Spirit go with us until we meet again. Amen. Amen.